the museum, uh, and then did a proposal for the green pattern, but based in France. I don't quite know how we pulled that off, but it's probably an interesting story of its own note. But uh, today he's telling us about his work on conservation genetics of California San Juan. So, welcome, Tom. Thanks, Greg. Uh, um, it's really great to be back here um, at the MVC. It's, uh, I realized um, a little while ago that it's been actually more than 10 years now since I've given a museum lunch, and more than eight since I've even attended one, or even been in this room. Um, but it all seems so familiar and just like yesterday, uh, even though the, the audience is dominated by new faces. Um, the MBZ, uh, in, in addition to its very, very long history of um, curating specimens from California and elsewhere, has um, a really, really incredibly important legacy um, in all the people that it's trained and all the people that it's influenced who are working um, with wildlife and natural history in, in California and elsewhere. And my thought and my work has certainly been influenced quite um, extensively by my affiliation with the museum. Um, I actually am, uh, I, I was initially trained as sort of a mammologist um, and uh, applied here to graduate school um, initially with the intention of working with Jim Patton who um, wrote me an email back saying, I'm in the Amazon for six months, I've got 10, 10 graduate students already, uh, I think you should look elsewhere. <laughs> Um, in spite of that, I came up to visit and I met with a number of people, including Monty Slatkin. Um, and uh, Jim was still in the Amazon, and um, Monty very gratefully offered me the opportunity to come and work with him and learn a little bit about population genetics. And of course, I jumped at the opportunity, um, all the while maintaining my interest in both um, using molecular population genetics to better understand wildlife, as well as my interest in conservation. Um, we, uh, my group continues to uh, work on mammals, um, marine mammals primarily, um, but most of our work now is with the largest vertebrate group, um, the most abundant um, in terms of species and probably animals. Um, that, uh, <laughs> well, we can call it a uh, museum of ter terrestrial vertebrate as well. <laughs> um, and we are, um, and, and actually, um, most of our work is with salmonid fishes. I think most of you know uh, probably quite a bit about salmonids, um, but I'll just say a few words about them. Um, they're, aside from being one of the more successful families of fish um, in the world, they're also incredibly important um, for a variety of different reason, reasons, reasons econo economically and ecologically, both in California and in the Northern Pacific. Um, they're the basis of billions of dollars of fisheries, um, both commercial and recreational, in the US, Canada, Russia, Japan, so on and so forth. Um, they're also incredibly important ecologically. They, they move huge, huge um, quantities of marine-derived nutrients um, far inland, um, as far in as uh, Idaho and um, you know the, the near the crest of the Sierra Nevada in California. Um, and they're important culturally for most of the native groups in the in the northern Pacific. Very, very interesting creatures. And, and one of the secrets to their success has been the ability to, um, and, and actually one of the uh, problems that's leading to their current um, predicament is their ability to um, exploit um, as profitable um, the uh, both marine and the, uh, not the estuarine, the aquatic environment. So um, we have about 25 projects in my group with salmonids. And um, they are, um, they involve things such as population structure and size, uh, population history, the study of behavior, kin relationships, um, the detection of natural selection, individual discrimination, 
um, life history evolution and the fishery stock proportions, um, which is something that's pretty new to our group, and, and I'll talk a little bit about towards the end of uh, my presentation. Um, and in California, there are um, three widespread salmonid species, and there are three or four others that just sort of poke into northern California along the coast. Those three species are steelhead trout, um, coho salmon, and chinook salmon. And all of them occur um, here in the Bay Area. And I'm going to talk about um, the various aspects of uh, population structure um, and history of all three of the species um, in uh, using a couple of um, selected uh, bits of work that we've done. Um, they're all members of the genus Oncorhynchus, um, which are the Pacific Salmonids. Um, I'm going to talk first about steelhead trout, also known as rainbow trout, um, an incredibly variable uh, polytypic species. We've got um, a really extraordinary um, study system set up um, in a small watershed called Scott Creek right north of our laboratory. Um, in Santa Cruz County, it also happens to be the southernmost persistent population of coho salmon, or the, the site of the southernmost population. And um, these are people who work um, in both my group and um, another group, Salmon Ecology, um, uh, that, who are doing extensive field work and collecting ecological information about individual fish. We've got a, a weir and a fish trap right at, at the entrance to this basin so that we can um, trap um, and sample all individuals entering and leaving the basin, which is really a great thing to have. So um, about four years ago, I came and gave a seminar um, in integrative biology talking about um, our uh, coastal California steelhead population structure study. This was a, a huge piece of work that we did, um, sampling 60 populations in the same year, the same cohort of individuals in an attempt to, um, to uh, eliminate or reduce temporal variance in allele frequencies in our inference. 4,500 fish um, and 18 microsatellite loci, 132,000 um, allele copies were sampled, um, and 540 alleles had their frequencies estimated for this work. Um, and just, I, I'm going to build on this and tell you about some new results that we have from um, this species, so I just want to quickly go over what we found in that earlier piece of work. In spite of the best efforts of the California Department of Fish and Game, who have stocked literally billions of fish from this species in every body of water in California to which they have access, and some which they shouldn't have access to, fly over in planes and dump fish in, um, we found that there actually is a fair amount of population structure dependent upon geography in this species. And this was really quite stunning to a lot of people because everyone assumed that all the stocking would have erased any signal of ancestral population structure. But um, lo and behold, um, it, it was very, very concordant with geography. Is there a corner around? Oh, here we go. Um, and uh, as you know, a friend of mine looking at this said, well, it's basically like driving down Highway 1 um, from the Klamath in the north down to Southern California. Um, and we found a highly significant, um, a highly significant relationship between geographic and genetic distance, um, commonly referred to as isolation by distance, but a lot of variance that not, it was not explained by geography. Um, that we attributed to um, both changes in population size, um, which have a huge effect on estimators of FST, um, as well as uh, stocking that we don't think had no effect. We just think that it hasn't completely erased population structure. Um, these, this species is broken up to, into six uh, administrative units called um, evolutionarily significant units, or um, at this point called um, distinct population segments um, because a number of them are listed under the Endangered Species Act, and, and I forgot to mention that, but all, populations of all three of these species I'm talking about are ESA listed um, either as threatened or endangered. 
Um, those, those administrative boundaries were built on the basis of um, mitochondrial DNA and ecological information. Um, so what I've done here is taken the individual genotypes from all of those fish that were used to construct the tree that I just showed you and, and the, the um, relationship between um, geographic and genetic distance and um, used a model-based clustering method structure to um, assign them individually to one of three primary clusters. And we did this with a whole variety of different numbers of K or, or um, hypothesized clusters. And then I just took the individual genotypes and I arrayed them from north to south. And what you see, of course, is that there are quite distinct breaks um, in, um, along the coast that um, we, that correspond to reductions in gene flow. Um, and uh, one uh, hybridized population up in um, Redwood Creek in Redwood National Park in the north. And this is the Smith River here, and this is um, a population near Morro Bay in San Luis Obispo there. Um, so we did this a whole bunch of times, and then we basically plotted where those breaks occurred with highest frequency. And interestingly, they occurred at places where you might, um, just on the basis of biogeography or geography, um, have uh, hypothesized that they would be at the Golden Gate. This is Russian Gulch. It's a stretch of about 30 miles of coast, um, north of the Russian River, south of the Guala River, where no streams penetrate more than about three kilometers into the interior. The Lost Coast, a similar sort of um, piece of geography in Humboldt Bay. Interestingly, only this location here currently um, is the boundary between two um, ESUs or DPSs. Um, so, uh, well, so much for um, attempts to do with mitochondrial DNA. Um, however, uh, that study stopped right about here in Morro Bay and um, did not sample the largest basin in the, what's the, known as the South Central ESU, it goes from Monterey Bay down to the Santa Maria River, um, or any of these others aside from the San Inez, simply because we couldn't find enough fish to get reasonable samples. Um, this is currently broken into two ESUs that have a boundary right there. Um, this is ESA endangered, the highest level of protection afforded by the ESA, and this is ESA threatened. Now, in this study, we used the same uh, genetic markers, we looked at almost 2,000 fish, but what we did in this study that we didn't do in the earlier studies, we also sampled populations of reproducing trout above five major dams in all four of these, ba all five of these basins. Um, actually, there's six because one of them is above two dams, um, including populations in <coughs> way, way high up in the Salinas River. This is uh, Tassajara Creek and the San Antonio Nacimiento River, Arroyo Seco, all the way down to the Santa Clara um, River in uh, Ventura and LA County. Um, and well, what did we find? Oh, this is um, an important, I, I put some fish pictures in here because I know this is a vertebrate zoology group. And, and what I wanted to impress upon you here is that um, Simply looking at morphology in this species does not give you a good idea of ancestry. These fish are all from Scott Creek. These numbers here indicate number of years in freshwater and saltwater um, as we have determined both from ecological data and in some cases scales and otoliths. And what you can see is just an incredible amount of variation. This is a two-year-old resident trout. This is a three-year-old sea run, um, and, and, the, uh, and this is a five-year-old um, resident trout. Um, just an incredible amount of variation. Most of these fish, um, probably all of them, I'm not sure that we have the genetic data for every one of them, um, are all, all share recent common ancestors, and um, to a certain extent are, are interbreeding. So, what these trout above these dams, which I, I should mention are not part of the ESA listed um, administrative units, 
um, what they might be doing in terms of life history is very little indication of their ancestry. Well, um, this is a better indication of their ancestry. We also looked at um, samples of hatchery rainbow trout that are used in stocking every one of the reservoirs that um, are above these dams. And what you can see here is, well, there these trout above these dams are um, mainly um, structured by the basin of origin with, without regard to whether they're below dams or above dams. They're not hatchery trout, that's for sure. The hatchery trout are not reproducing, for the most part, above these dams. But the fish that are reproducing above the dams, oh, this is just meant to show you. So here, this isn't, um, these are the individual genotypes in three-dimensional space. These are the hatchery trout, and that's all the southern steelhead um, collected in our study. Um, and again, this is individual-based structure results. These are the hatchery strains. This is the Santa Clara River, which is the, one of the largest basins in Southern California, and also the site of Fillmore Hatchery. And this is the rest of the South Central and Southern California ESU. Um, and we also did manage to collect a few fish all the way down to San Diego County. And one of the things that we found, again, the green are steelhead ancestry, red hatchery ancestry. Um, and blue, some sort of hybrid, we're not entirely sure. You have steelhead origin fish all the way down to San Diego. That's San Mateo Creek, that's in San Onofre State Park. That's, uh, in fact, um, about 100 feet from where they want to build that tow road, where we collected that fish. Um, so, now I'm going to tell you about the latest um, on these populations. And this is something I have to say, I was really excited to be able to come here and present. Um, because uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to give a very, very concrete example of the value of museum collections. Um, so a few years back, I was reading um, a big monograph by John Otterbein Snyder um, called The Fishes of the Streams Tributary to Monterey Bay, California. This is, uh, was published in 1912 in the Bulletin of the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries, which is the predecessor of uh, NOAA and of the National Marine Fisheries Service. And John Otterbein Snyder, as probably some of you know, was a student of David Starr Jordan's, the first uh, president of Stanford University, and a very prominent zoology. He was also responsible, it turns out, for organizing the fish collections at the National Museum. And um, my understanding is that he was actually offered the directorship of the, muse uh, the National Museum, but turned it down to come back to Stanford. Um, well, I'm reading this paper, and he describes all of these specimens that he collected and sent to um, the National Museum, or, or took with him there when he went to organize their collections. And a little light bulb went off in my head. What if they're still there? They were. Um, and we, we, collect, we took samples from over 300 individuals collected in 1897 and 1909, incidentally, in streams that we were already studying, um, for which we already had population genetic data for contemporary populations. Now, those of you who work on museum specimens probably um, are well aware of the, the rarity of population samples from a long time in the past. And um, this was really an extraordinary opportunity. Um, and we um, were, and these are the sample sizes that for which we successfully got genetic data from each of these historical populations. And these are some modern populations um, for comparison. There are actually even more specimens than this, but we weren't, um, we, it was really hard work to get data from these. Um, and in fact, um, all of our previous work on, on these populations involved um, microsatellites. We couldn't get micro, we couldn't get usable microsatellite data out of many of these specimens. We're, we're still working on that, but it's a really, really long slog. However, we did get mitochondrial DNA by piecing together a number of small fragments, and here are the results. We got about a 200 base pair um, section of the control region. First off, 
even these very preeminent early ichthyologists weren't always right. The Lagunitas Creek population was all coho salmon, uh, misidentified. Um, so what I'm showing you here are, these are just frequency distribution pie charts of the mtDNA haplotypes in the historical samples and the museum specimens. So these are two hatchery strains that we looked at as well, contemporary, for the eight populations that turned out to be steelhead trout. Um, there are no significant differences in um, any measure diversity that we've looked at. Um, four new alleles or haplotypes were detected, three in historical samples and one in a contemporary population. Um, the differences between the contemporary and historical um, allele frequency distributions range from um, quite minor. I mean, these are very, very similar with the exception of that one haplotype. Um, this as well, all the same alleles present. You know, these sample sizes are small enough that one cannot conclude that, they're, that even the frequencies of the haplotypes are different. There are a few, though, that are really quite different. And interestingly, those are the th those three are ones that are now above dams. Um, and, and it's maybe a little bit hard to tell because these colors are not great. But um, for the most part, there well, no, not for the most part. There are no instances in which there's been a total replacement of mtDNA haplotypes from 100 years ago until now. Although, wherever a population is above a dam, um, there have been significant changes. This is really, this is where it gets interesting. Well, I mean, this is interesting too, but. So, um, this is the microsatellite data from the contemporary samples for those same populations. This is just pulled out of that earlier, well, actually some of these were not in the earlier graph that I showed you, but you know, it's a reasonable R squared, highly significant um, relationship. Um, when you look at mtDNA for these modern samples, however, it's just a mess. Um, they go away, the, the, this is non-significant, um, R squared explains basically nothing. Take a look at this. With the historical samples, Look at that relationship. Highly, highly significant R squared value above 0.9. Um, I, I have to say, uh, th this was one of the more stunning results that I've looked at. I mean, uh, it took me a little while to realize um, how um, how stunning it was. But that is the the, mo the, the tightest relationship that I've ever seen for a vertebrate, um, and. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. And this is all from 100-year-old museum specimens. Formal and fixed? Well, um, they're not fixed in formula now. Um, he talks about preserving them in um, his work. Um, we, I don't think that they were formal and fixed um, because there's abundant DNA. It's just very, very short fragments. We've got a number of SNP loci that we've specifically designed to be very, very um, small targets that we're going to be applying to these samples once we get some money to do it. Um, so, let me just go to conclusions here. Migration and drift equilibrium represents historical population structure of the species. The reason I highlighted this is, you know, you would think that these are migratory fish, that the, that would be sort of our null model for understanding the population structure of the species. But it's really not, and even the, the, the language with which uh, fishery biologists talk about uh, migration in salmon strain um, is indicative of that. It's, it's believed to be a, sort of a mistake when a salmon or a salmonid does not go back to its stream of origin. Um, well, clearly, migration and reproduction um, based upon um, geographic distance is an extremely important part of maintaining population structure and therefore effective size in the species. And for us to treat populations as separate entities um, for the purposes of conservation is bound to fail. Um, and in spite of the difference between the, the historical and modern, you know, uh, it's 
population structure is still relatively intact. It's mostly concordant with geography. Um, this one is the one that has caused a lot of grief for us. We've got water agencies sent, having lawyers sending us letters. Um, say, um, you know, basically we've shown that the populations above dams in California, we've replicated this result in the Central Valley and elsewhere, are descended from steelhead trout that were trapped there when the dams were built. And in fact, the hatchery fish that are being planted in the reservoirs are not reproducing in any great numbers. Um, but the fish that were there before continue to be, because these were mainly juvenile collections. Uh, this is just a summary of population structure. And uh, again, that's just what I said there. Um, so, and there are trout all the way down to San Diego that have um, a <coughs> signal of actually steelhead ancestry. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about coho salmon. This is Joe Anderson, um, who worked in my lab for a few years and now is at the University of Washington. Um, Joe, uh, that's actually in Alaska, but uh, it's, a, it's okay. Um, so coho salmon reached the southern extent of the range in Santa Cruz County. Actually, um, the, the right outside my house, actually, practically, in the San Lorenzo River, all that, although that population is not persistent. Um, Scott Creek is. There are two ESUs in California of coho salmon, the Southern Oregon, Northern California, and the Central California Coast ESU. They're both in pretty dire straits. Um, the, Southern Calif uh, the Central California Coast ESU um, is ESA listed as endangered. Um, and many populations in brood years um, have gone extinct in the last 10 or 20 years. Unfortunately, we've documented further, and I call them catastrophic declines this year, because this year was, the, the coho salmon have a, a very strict three-year um, lifespan, and, and that leads to um, demographic structure, um, so that every third year you can predict the run abundance based upon the abundance three years um, prior. This was a strong brood year, um, the strongest brood year throughout the ESU. Um, in Scott Creek, we had a total of one fish, a three-year-old fish return this year. Redwood Creek in Muir Woods um, in a Golden Gate National Recreation Area, zero fish. They were expecting several hundred this year. Um, and there's been a 70 percent, we've documented a 70 percent decline in returns this year in these three issues. Um, so this is a pretty dire situation. Um, and we have been studying the population structure of this species for a number of years, um, some standard population structure questions, and also two others that I'm going to briefly touch on. One is that Pine Gulch Creek, which is right near Redwood Creek, um, drains into Bolinas Lagoon, um, and is in Point Reyes National Seashore. It was historically a coho stream, but until about four years ago, coho salmon had not been seen there in about 20 years. The Park Service was entertaining a petition to reintroduce coho salmon there, um, and lo and behold, they appeared. Uh, and there are a lot of very active environmentalists in West Marin. Um, Incidentally, Pine, Pine Gulch Creek um, drains the San Andreas Fault Valley southward. Um, Alima Creek, which drains into Tomales Bay, um, drains it in a northward direction. And for a number of miles, they're only about um, 100 yards from each other. Um, and Alima Creek is one of the strongest coho salmon populations in California. So they hypothesized that um, the Bucket Brigade brought fish over. Um, so, and, and the other thing that I just want to um, point out is this is a post hoc um, question that we examined. Um, there, uh, we're currently facing a lawsuit to delist coho salmon south of San Francisco. Um, this is a lawsuit that's being um, prosecuted by uh, the owner of Big Creek Lumber, the McCrary family. Um, who are claiming that they're non-native in Santa Cruz because of a variety of well-selected historical accounts. Uh, so, you know, we, do, uh, we looked at this question sort of post hoc with not great sampling. 
Um, this, is a, uh, this is a compendium of samples collected over about five years, adults and juveniles. Um, a whole variety of very sort of opportunistically sampled um, populations. Uh, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Um, we, again, the ESU boundary was um, devised on the basis of ecological data, almost entirely a little bit of mitochondrial and alzheimer data. They didn't really know whether it was right. Um, as I'll tell you in a little bit, it, it, there does appear to be support for it. Um, well, here's the answer to our question about Pine Gulch Creek. Um, Here's a lima up here. This is Redwood Creek in Moran, um, draining near woods. These two are only about five kilometers from each other um, in, um, in shoreline distance, even though this and this are only 100 yards from each other um, physically, but draining in, operation, and, uh, in opposite directions. So we concluded on the basis of this that Pine Gulch Creek, Pine Gulch Creek was a natural recolonization event. Um, I just also want to point out that um, the south of San Francisco coho salmon populations are um, all most closely related to other Central California Coast ESU populations. There's no signal of ancestry from fish from Washington State that were planted there in 1916 as the, um, as the uh, plaintiffs claim. Um, this just shows, uh, this is a frequency distribution of FST values um, for um, comparisons um, between basins, within um, basins, different tributaries, and between years in the same location, just to give you some idea of the relative population structure, um, both geographically and, and temporally. Um, and uh, this is something that people don't like to think about. I'm just going to say two words about it. Um, FST, well, more than two words, highly dependent upon effective size. Um, so absolute values of FST are um, very, very um, sensitive to assumptions about population size. Um, we do find a signal of isolation by distance. Uh, you know, this is what you would expect if the populations in Santa Cruz County were the result of natural um, natural migration genetic drift processes as opposed to having been planted there by uh, as sport fish uh, um, as claimed by the planets. Could, could I ask a couple slides back? So the brood year does not separate populate. There's no genetic difference that there was a big cluster that's black. Uh, that Those are they're very, very, um, yeah, most so of that. that's imprecise then at the very least, the brood year, uh, the three year uh, you said. Uh, yeah. They yeah. can come back two years or four years That's one population. That's right. We actually documented the first uh, four-year-old coho salmon um, reproducing a couple of years ago. Two-year-old um, coho salmon are, are fairly common, call them jacks and jills for females, um, but we don't know anything about how much they reproduce other than what, the, you know, indirect inference um, of the type that you just pointed out. You know, um, we ended up doing this again. Um, in 2003, uh, we collaborated with some field crews that went out and sampled the same cohort because the plaintiffs were making a whole bunch of hay about um, the temporal variation and, um, and life stage variation in our data. So we did it again, um, trying to correct for that. This is all juveniles from the same year, same cohort. Um, collected in the summer and fall of 2003. Uh, cut to the chase. Um, Scott Creek, Santa Cruz County, most closely related to Redwood Creek, which is the, the first coho bearing stream north of the Golden Gate, which um, is where their petition ends. Uh, we also did find evidence for a relatively well supported boundary between um, the uh, Central California. Um, coast ESU and the uh, Central California Coast and the Sonk ESU. So it seems like they actually did a pretty good job um, inferring that in, with very little data. Interestingly, what we found in this last investigation where we did a fair amount of sampling in the Klamath is that the Klamath populations of coho salmon appear to be quite distinct from the rest of the Southern Oregon, Northern California coast um, 
populations, and um, uh, that was sort of unexpected. So, um, and uh, let's see how much time I have. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'm going to say a couple words about this. Um, so this is the CCCSU. These are these streams are actually the coho bearing streams or tributaries um, in California. The, these little dots here, um, and you can see there's not a whole lot in the CCC. And as I told you, these catastrophic declines that have been going on for 10 to 20 years um, have spurred a lot of activity. Um, and they, the activity that they have primarily has spurred has been the um, establishment of captive broodstock programs. Um, there are two in operation in our, in our ESU, one at um, Warm Springs Hatchery in the Russian River, the other in Santa Cruz um, County, ironically, on the land of the McCrary family who is um, trying to get them delisted. Um, they claim they're good advocates for the fish, they just don't think that they should be SA listed. Um, and, and so these are, we're not operating these, but um, they asked us if we could um, assist them in genetic management of their broodstock. And so we're doing that. Um, and we're doing a whole bunch of stuff, but um, one of the main things we're doing is we're actually dynamically creating a matrix of relatedness um, to assist in breeding. If you think about it, we know that Salmonids, along with just about every other vertebrate, uh, practice in, practices inbreeding avoidance um, in the wild. But when you take fish out of the wild and you mix their eggs and milk in a hatchery, you totally short circuit the inbreeding avoidance mechanisms that are operating and in small populations, that can definitely have consequences. So um, I'm going to tell you about what we're doing there. We're also doing some other things that I'm not going to talk about in the interest of time. Um, the Russian Re River program has been in operation for about six years. Initially, we took fish from Lagunese Creek, Alima Creek, and Marin County with the idea that if they were really, really similar, we might be able to um, just treat them as one population. And we knew that there were going to be problems with inbreeding in the Russian River because there's really only one tributary where they persist. Um, so uh, we, let's see if there's a slide out of out of um, place here. But, but let me just tell you about this matrix. So what we do is we we actually um, we use a, the female as the focal individual, and we, um, on the basis of relatedness, we rank all of the potential, her potential mates, and we um, sort of block out the ones that are related at the level of half sib or above. And um, what you can see is that you know a particular individual um, may be a very good mate for some females and a very poor mate for others. So. Um, to the extent that you have confidence in these individual values, which actually we don't, but um, <laughs> we do feel like the, the overall um, um, is probably better than nothing. Um, you, you can actually um, you can avoid a lot of inbreeding. Now, um, that was sort of a good situation. This is what it looks like in some years. Um, there are very, very, very small numbers of families that are reproducing in, in the Russian River and in Scott Creek. Um, and this is just a, a way to visualize that. This is the mean coefficient of relatedness per individual. So this is the average an average coefficient of relatedness, 0.5 means you're related to every other individual in the population as a full SID. Um, and this is these are just the relative distributions of those values for um, the Russian River population in Lagunitas Creek. It's pretty stark. So using this breeding matrix, um, how do we improve things? Well, this is a simulated distribution of um, relatedness values uh, for individuals from that population that I showed you that are uh, that randomly mated. And this is the distribution of RXY values um, that one would acquire if one were to use the best mate um, based upon the relatedness coefficient every time. We don't achieve that because of asynchronicity and reproductive maturity, but um, you can see it's a pretty big improvement. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so, co salmon in California have population structure concordant with geography, same as we saw for steelhead. 
Pine Gulch colonized from Redwood Creek and not from Alima. Maybe the Klamath should be a separate ESU. Um, uh, we'll talk about that. We can theoretically reduce the mean coefficient of relatedness between mated pairs almost to zero using this matrix. Um, but there are a lot of other things that we can do um, and, and that we will be doing in the future, um, including um, estimating pedigree relationships directly as opposed to indirectly through a, a summary statistic. Okay, I have, yeah, I'm going to talk briefly about Chinook salmon, uh, and I'm going to talk about the ocean. Um, this is something brand new for us, um, and it's really interesting and kind of exciting. Um, so uh, we are using um, genetic stock identification techniques to identify the river of origin, the run of origin of Chinook salmon that are caught in commercial and recreational fisheries um, in California um, with the idea that this will be a tool to more effectively manage um, Chinook salmon to meet both conservation and harvest objectives. Um, now, the reason why this is possible all of a sudden, well, it's actually been possible for a while, but over the last few years, uh, my group and a number of others from Alaska all the way down here to California um, have created an enormous standardized data set. We chose 13 microsatellites, standardized them so we could run them in all our laboratories, and then we genotyped them on 120 fish per population. This is actually now 200 populations. Uh, put them all in a centralized database that you can call up on the web. Um, and we do stock ID with it. And it's, it's actually an incredibly powerful tool. Um, so uh, the DFO group um, on Vancouver Island, Beecham Whitler and Company, um, have been using this for the last few years um, in uh, in-season fishery management with the uh, British Columbia Troll Fishery. Their conservation stock is the west coast of Vancouver Island, which has been in decline. And they've been doing in-season real-time um, stock assessment and essentially closing and opening very, very small geographic areas. Um, and in doing that, they've increased their exploitation of the quota, from, they've gone from 30% to 90% with a direct benefit of the fishermen, to the fishermen of 17 million bucks, at the same time that they've managed to decrease their impact on their conservation stock fairly substantially. I mean, um, they say where fishing can occur. That's, that's right, yeah, and where it can't occur. Yeah. Um, and um, so this has been you know, very, very successful. Um, so we started playing with this a couple of years ago in Monterey Bay. We looked at 735 fish that students um, in my lab went out and collected at the ports. Um, and well, we've got a very different fishery, at least in 2006 in, this, in Monterey Bay. It's dominated by the Central Valley Fall. This ESA listed endangered winter run is not an insignificant um, contributor, uh, but it's a pretty clean fishery, really. Um, and, and if you look at the the, um, the assignments week by week, you know there's a very suggestive increase in the proportion of winter run in the begin from the beginning to the second half of the of the month. It increases in at the, in the last part of the month. It's not significant, but it's um, close to significant. Um, the sample size issues here are really daunting. Well, what about this year? <laughs> what a difference a year makes. These are the uh, sport fishery samples from this year. And what we see is that the, the abundance of Central Valley fall run has decreased dramatically relative to the others. That's why all this has expanded so dramatically. So you probably have all read in the paper about the collapse of the Central Valley fall. And the water, the pumping groups are saying, well, no, it's happening to all the fish out there, and it doesn't have to do with diversion of water in the, in the Central Valley. Well, it may not, but it has something to do with the Central Valley because um, it's clearly affecting the Central Valley fall run uh, much more um, severely than it is any of these others. You know, we went from 0.7% um, Klamath and Coastal to, you know, uh, you know almost 8% Klamath um, in one year. Um, and uh, so I'm going to skip right over that. Um, uh, anyway, this is, mm, yeah, I'll skip over that too. Um, so I'm going to just, this is the very last thing I'm going to talk about, tell you briefly. So we started collaborating with the fleet, the commercial fleet, last year. And what we did is we gave him collecting supplies and GPS units and said, 
click a waypoint every time you catch and sample a fish. Um, and then we do GSI on them. Um, and uh, we analyzed about 3,200 samples. We were looking to see if we could divide the management area that currently goes from about, uh, about Half Moon Bay to Fort Bragg um, into a finer geographic scale. Believe it or not, that's one management area. The entire thing is open or closed based upon the overall impacts on your conservation stocks. So this is in May. Um, and this was what the distribution of, of samples looked like. They ranged from all the way up here to Fort Bragg, down to Monterey Bay. They were supposed to stop sampling about here, but they actually sampled in the south as well. Um, and this is what the stock composition looked like. Again, really dramatically reduced abundance of Central Valley fall. People started freaking out when they saw this because the proportion of Coastal California Chinook, which is an ESA-listed ESU, ranges from south from about the Eel River down to um, well down to the Russian River, um, was much higher than anybody expected. It um, this uh, this has never been fishery impacts have never been assayed on this. We have no way of doing that without GSI. Um, so created a bit of hubbub. Um, but when you look geographically or by latitude and, and you divide into, this is what we're proposing at Point Reyes be the new um, potential division between these uh, two sub areas. The proportion of both coast, the coastal California Chinook and Klamath Chinook in the northern part of this um, geographic, uh, this management area is about three times what it is to the south, about four times what it is in the Monterey Bay management area. Um, and not quite as dramatic for Klamath, but still um, something that can potentially be exploited. And if you look even a little closer, what you find is that most of these um, conservation fish that are being caught are right here in this area, right off the mouth of the Russian River. Um, and if you plot the catch of coastal Chinook by latitude, what you see is, whoa, almost 65% of your impacts are in like a 15 kilometer stretch of the coast, which suggests that you might be able to close a very, very small fraction of the coast um, and really minimize your impacts um, and allow harvest to occur on a more abundant stock. Um, and you know, this is just to show that, well, I mean, really you need to think about this number in terms of the overall catch. and. Yeah, there is a concentration of catch here, but the proportion of coastal Chinook is still about double what it would be if they were randomly distributed. Um, anyway, so what can we do with this? Well, hopefully we can predict fishery mortality and, and use that to operate quota fisheries or um, do in-season adaptive management. Um, ideally, eventually, we'd like to combine this with oceanographic data so that we can go collect some data on oceanographic parameters and predict um, how many uh, predict when salmon will be there and from what populations? There are very, very distinct um, migration patterns for different stocks. Um, I've already told you all this stuff, and so I'm just going to zip right over it. Um, and now I need to, oh, actually, I, I do want to talk about this because. Um, what we're doing now is we're going individual based. We have shown in a series of papers that you can actually, um, by just sampling parents and using large scale parentage inference, you can identify the offspring of individuals that have been um, genotyped, who's uh, have been genotyped. And, and since uh, on average a female produces about 5,000 fish, and currently they mechanically tag all of those juveniles, um, it's a highly efficient tagging method, and, and we call that full parental genotyping, parentage-based tagging. Um, and we are now um, trying to convince the California Department of Fish and Game to implement this at their hatcheries so that we have 100% tagging of all of the hatchery fish um, that doesn't require touching the juveniles that will also help us to construct enormous pedigrees over time and space so we can do all kinds of quantitative genetics and, and lots of other fun stuff. So we're really excited about this. And it recently was recommended by the Pacific Salmon Commission um, as a potential alternative for coded wire tags for 
um, coastwide Canada and U.S. Um, management of salmon fisheries. Uh, I need to acknowledge all the people who contributed to this work, um, including the three Andersons, all unrelated, um, <laughs> and the two Martinez's, both unrelated as well, just by chance, uh, and uh, including some people who you might know, um, well, Eric Anderson, probably a number of you know, and Derek Gurman, who uh, is a vertebrate biologist as well. Um, and with that, I will thank you all for your attention. Thanks. Thanks. Some folks, including me, may need to run the classes. Uh, so please listen, stay, and ask questions. It's a great book. Do you let people hire for the moment? Sorry, I really didn't want to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. Charles, what can you tell us about the uh, prospect for uh, for salmon, commercial salmon fishing in California? <laughs> what does your... What oh, gosh. Um, well, you know, um, global climate change um, is, in my opinion, the most daunting obstacle um, to any sort of a stable salmon fishery, not just in California, but everywhere. Um, gl global climate change um, is going to change prospects for fish fisheries dramatically, but we don't know how exactly, um, other than um, it's not likely to be good. <laughs> um, so uh, that... That's a bigger, a bigger deal than... That's a bigger deal than this. That said, um, you know, there is a huge amount of uh, imprecision in the way that the current fishery management is done. They only, they, they, it's all based upon these very, very large aggregated yeah. fishery mortality estimates that are derived from coat of wire tags, which are um, these mechanically implanted um, pieces of metal that um, are required cutting the fish's head off and fishing through the head under a microscope and then reading the, 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 the code on the tag by hand. Um, and it only applies to hatchery fish. Um, and uh, and there are whole ESUs that have no coat of wire tag fish. So they're doing all the stock assessment based on extremely limited and incredibly imprecise and inaccurate information. So at a minimum, we think that applying genetic stock identification will improve the prospects for stabilizing fisheries um, by increasing the precision of our um, fishery impact estimates and extending them to the things that we really care about, which are wild fish and ESU, uh, ESA listed fish. Yeah, so the, it was interesting, quite interesting to see that distribution of where the fish are actually caught. Mm -hmm. now, were those sport or commercial? Commercial, that was or the com That was commercial. So that's the main uh, harvest there, or I mean, a huge fraction of the harvest, is that? Well, uh, it's a relatively small fishery. On the, along the coast, um, that was you know one I mean, month compared to compared to uh, sports. Oh, uh, yeah. In general, yeah. And so they catch a lot more fish. Mm -hmm. Presumably, the fish are distributed. Are we maybe that's an open question too. Where do they, where are they spending their time in the uh, you know feeding, growing so huge? That's right. In the ocean yeah. and so on. <laughs> and you know you think that commercial fishery over decades or generations mm -hmm. would have figured out oh, there's just as good north up here and there are 75 boats you know and shouting it or whatever that's why i was surprised to see that these big holes and that concentration well that just means the fish are clustered i mean they uh they they, they are going to where the fish are <laughs> that's you know, right there yeah. are big so those are deserts fish deserts between them that's reliable well they're not fish deserts per se i mean these fish move all around i mean these are those are temporally specific actually if i was to show you that same map for July, that was the May map I showed you. Um, actually, most of the fish were caught right off Point Reyes, and in between Point Reyes and the Farallons, which was right in the middle of that. So it's, you know, it, it, they move around, and uh, 
when they bite um, is, you know, I'm not a fisherman, so I don't understand exactly um, how they um, figure out when and where fish are. But we, what we've started to do, um, what we're doing this year is we're collecting effort data as well. So we know not just where they're catching fish, but where they're trying to catch fish. And that's going to give us a much more accurate picture of where fish are in the ocean and when, which is what we want to know. I'm a, I'm a fisheries ecologist and also belong to a salmon fishing club. Mm -hmm. I've observed that the anglers, commercial and recreational, have a very um, high sight fidelity to where they go to fish. Yep. Because I go out fishing with my buddies with satellite maps and try to explain fronts and changes in feeding behavior and so on, and they say, thanks, Mike, we're going over here. Because that's <laughs> where they always that's went. Really and you know, often that's where the fish are. And in general, the fish do tend to concentrate down along certain features that the anglers can recognize. So I think it is important to look at the effort and, and the distribution of, of effort, because that can really throw things off. And it's right. kind of, if, if, um, if a policy is enacted to restrict fishing in some of those areas that you show the high catches, that's going to limit access by recreational anglers because that's where they can get to. Well, the rec and the commercial fisheries are managed, and the seasons are completely independent of each other. So, but yeah, but this year it's not going to be good even for rec fishers. It's going to be really bad. Yeah, the last two years have been really, really bad. But, well, you, um, there won't be seasons this year. I wanted to ask you about the um, population structure mm -hmm. of the Chinook. Mm -hmm. Is there, is it just totally overwhelmed by the hatchery stocks? In the Central Valley, yeah. Are there some residual, what you would call wild or historic populations left? For Central Valley Fall Run, which is the dominant um, group of Chinook salmon in California, there's no population structure. It's all, you know, I mean, they truck these fish down to the Cartina Strait and dump them in the ocean, so they totally short circuit the um, their homing mechanism, and you know, and it's just it's just a mess. So yeah, there, there's not there. No, no, you you may or may not know, but the Central Valley is also the site of the greatest, um, at least, run timing diversity, um, temporal diversity of Chinook salmon in the world. Um, we have four, at least historically, there were four um, genetically and um, phenotypically distinct runs of Chinook salmon. Nowhere else has um, more than three, in very few places even have three. Um, that, aside from the sort of uh, introgression of the fall and late fall to um, homogeneity, the, the spring run, the winter run, and the fall, late fall run, do maintain um, substantial genetic differences that we can use in genetic stock identification. And, uh, so, with some caveats. But they're all coming from hatcheries. So. No, no. The uh, spring run is um, a naturally is a natural spawning ESU, um, essentially entirely, and somewhere in between 20 and 40 percent of the Central Valley Fall is naturally spawning. Um, there's a lot of hatchery production, but there are there is quite a bit of natural spawning as well in the Central Valley. So, well, thanks very much. Yeah.